Hey folks, just a, uh, a few changes this week. We're starting the holiday seasons. Can you believe that this is Thanksgiving already? Didn't it seem like uh, two months ago it was the 1st of January? Um, and it will be again soon. Next week, right? Uh, um, yeah, doesn't it? Um, we will be having the celebration at 7 Star at 12.30. Also, Sunday school will probably be a bit different today because we will be dealing with the boxes and getting them ready and labeled and out the door. Um, so please uh, plan for some changes in what's going on this morning. There will be no Bible study Tuesday. Uh, because on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we will be having our Thanksgiving service. So I hope that you will plan for that. And then we will uh, not be having prayer on Thursday, because it is Thanksgiving. Uh, and take that time to uh, celebrate and give thanks. Uh, it is not Turkey Day or Football Day. It is Thanksgiving. Give that time to, to give thanks. Uh, and then we will have prayer on Friday. Oh, Father, we come to you today and we lift up the name of Jesus. He's worthy of our praise, our adoration. You have commanded us to come into your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Because you are worthy, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. So we give you honor and praise and glory. We come into your presence in that power and joy. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts and minds to ask according to your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord. There are so many who are hurting today. As we enter this holiday season and we think of things that so many look forward to, parties, celebration, family, dinners, decorations. We think about those for whom these are the saddest days of the year, the loneliest days. God, give us eyes to see those who are not in the holiday spirit, but need someone to step up beside them and give them the path to peace. Oh, Father, we ask for courage to take the opportunities during this time over the next five weeks when the, even the world will be playing the music of Jesus. May we have the courage to lift up the true and living Christ. Not the caricature. Not the idol. But the Redeemer. God born in human flesh. O oh Lord, revive your church. We thank you that you have preserved us, given us hope for another short season. Lord, may we not waste this opportunity, but use it for your kingdom and for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you turn with me to Philippians? Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 10. Philippians 4 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. 
I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever my circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have want plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the Gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I want to talk today about being thankful in scarcity. Now, that is not a topic that certainly has been popular, at least in the current phase of the American church, going back through most of my lifetime. We have, as has often been the case going back through the history of the Protestant church, equated success with God's blessing. We have seen success as the best way to show God's glory or God's approval or God's power. We're all familiar with the running back or wide receiver standing in the end zone, ball in his hand pointing upward. But we don't see the running back lying on the ground, pounded into the turf by 20 guys laying on top of him, six inches short from making that fourth down conversion that could have won the game, stand to his feet and go like this. We equate a lack of success with a lack of God's presence and a lack of God's power. I've gone to an awful lot of men's meetings in my life. And it seems that about 80% of the time, maybe even more than that, maybe 90% of the time, when you go to a men's meeting, there will be a little devotional. And the man will get up to speak. And when he speaks, nine times out of ten, the topic will be David. Guys, can you agree with me on that one? And there's a reason. There is so much in David's life that is trial. David and Goliath. David overcoming Saul. David established as the king on the throne. David expanding the kingdom. David driving out the Philistines, David establishing an Israelite empire. Or there's Daniel in the lion's den. 
And if you're a kid and you've never heard the story, and there can be some tension. He's thrown into that lion's den. Oh, but the triumph when the next morning the king comes trembling and says, Daniel, are you still there? And triumphantly, Daniel 6.22, Do not be afraid, O king. God sent His angels to stop the mouth of the lions. I'm just. We go, hallelujah, praise God. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into the fire, bravely standing there. Oh, king, we're not careful how we answer you. Our God is able to deliver us from this fiery furnace. And He will deliver us out of your hand. And then in Daniel 3.25, the king looks in and he sees the three men walking around and he goes, didn't we throw three bound men in there? But I see four. And the fourth is like a son of the gods. And we like that. I like that. I like the win. Don't you? I like when God swoops in. Even if it's at the last minute. I grew up on those westerns where the wagon train was surrounded and the bandits were closing in. And just when it seems that all is lost in the distance you hear, that trumpet call and the thunder of hooves and the cavalry comes over the hill. But is the victory the thing that matters? Is the victory what shows God's glory? Or is it the fact that when Daniel went into that lion's den, he didn't go alone? God was with him. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into that fire, they didn't go in alone. Isn't the great promise not, you will always have victory, but the great promise is Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Paul comes along in Philippians, and he says something far, far different. He doesn't talk about my God always arrives with more than I need. He says this. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Now let's Take a little poll here. Who really wants to learn the secret of being content in not being well fed? Who wants to learn the secret 
of being in want, not having enough, running out of week long after you run out of dollars. Who wants to learn to be content when the credit card bill sneaks up and up and up and up and you said, I'm never going to charge like this again, but the groceries have to be bought or the car insurance has to be paid or the mortgage has to come from somewhere. Is there anybody going, yes, that's the kind of God I want? And it's not. But Paul says, it is the way God is. Look with me over at 2 Corinthians. This is utterly counterintuitive to everything that we push in our society. Second Corinthians twelve. Second Corinthians twelve. I'm going to begin at verse seven. Second Corinthians twelve seven. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. Now let me ask a serious question. Is there a danger of people becoming conceited today? Is pride a problem that we struggle with? As we talked about last week, uh, for those of you who came out for Harbingers, one of the things that uh, was readily apparent after 9-11 was the pride rather than the humility. We'll rebuild bigger. We had nothing to lecture that rich farmer that Jesus spoke about who said, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Because that's exactly what we set out to do. And we bragged about it. Any small glimpse of humility that might have been shown for the handful of days after the event evaporated. But it's not just the nation, it's the church, isn't it? How often in the church do we have the attitude, well, I'm going to heaven. as if to say, who cares about anyone else? And Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited, a messenger of Satan was given to torment me. Three times I pled with the Lord to take it away from me. I don't know what that says. Do, do, do you see the problem with that, that verse? With modern American theology? We're told just pray it once, name it and claim it, and it's yours. What does Paul say? He says, I begged God three times. Now, three times isn't a massive amount, but it's more than once, isn't it? And God's answer was the same every single time. No. The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power 
is made perfect in weakness. Now, now here's the question that we have to face honestly. Do we believe that? Because we don't act like we do. We act like we believe God's strength is made perfect in strength. When I'm strong, that shows God strong. When I win, that shows God wins. When I triumph, that shows that God triumphs. That's why the guy in the end zone can raise his finger like this. But the guy under the pile, six inches short, doesn't. Do we believe God's strength is made perfect in weakness? What's the proof that God approves of my life? Is it riches? If so, then let's be really honest. God approves of some of the most wicked people on earth because some of the richest people on earth are the most wicked, aren't they? That's not being judgmental. That's simply taking them at their word when they make statements that that renounce God and and, and reject any kind of truth and, and put forward what has for all of human history been considered immoral. And and yet, they're some of the most richest, most powerful people on earth. Hebrews says it differently. Look at Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Although he was a son, (coughs) he learned obedience from the triumphs he had. Is that what it says? He learned obedience from what he suffered. Where did Jesus win the greatest victory in human history? On the cross. Was it a moment of triumph or weakness? Did the world acknowledge His greatness? Now, He could have had the world acknowledge His greatness. All it would have taken was for Him to do what? Yep. All He had to do was walk off that cross. Lightning blasting in every direction. And the world would have fallen at His feet and acknowledged His greatness. But He wouldn't have won. His triumph came through the weakness of the cross. Verse 9, And once made perfect, How was he made perfect? He was perfect. He was perfect before there was a star in the sky. His obedience became complete because it was not a theoretical obedience. It was an actual one. He actually went through with it. 
It was Abraham's obedience. Not the obedience of God knows when he says, Abraham, take your son up. Oh, I know he's going to do it. Forget it. I don't need to say it. No, it was the actual obedience of Abraham walking up that same hill that Jesus walked up. Knowing, just like Jesus, that a death was coming. Abraham got to return with the joy of his heart. Jesus had to die. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. You see, Paul's goal was not merely our joy in the next 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years that you may or may not have left. And so here's what Paul says, Galatians 4.19, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. Let's be real honest. What forms Christ in us? Is it victories or hardships? And the honest answer all too often is hardships, isn't it? It's at the time when the ceiling is groaning and the floor is shaking and nothing seems secure that we cry out in honesty and humility to God and say, oh God, oh God, oh God. When we get that little card in the mail, bank error in your favor. Your bank account has just been raised $3 million. woo Now we may praise God for a moment, but very quickly, we're off to deal with our windfall. And, and God gets left behind. I'm talking about my life. Am I talking about yours too? We love to go back to the Old Testament for those heroes. Because there God is drawing a picture and He's using worldly situations to point to spiritual truths. And so the victories are worldly victories and often that's what we want. We want giants slain. We want Philistines defeated. We want false gods to be shown to be idiots. But I want you to think about the New Testament heroes. I want you to think about the New Testament heroes. Look with me at John 21. Jesus has risen from the dead. The, the disciples are so excited. Wow, are you going to establish the kingdom right now? Finally! Those three hard years, they're over. Wahoo! Sick him, Jesus! But, but Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he turns to Peter, and as Peter is pondering what Jesus is saying, in John 21, verse 18, here's what Jesus says, 21, 18. In John 21, 18, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you the truth. We don't know the 
full context. Maybe Jesus kind of prefaced it. Peter, I'm going to give you a prophecy about your life. Now, would you like for Jesus to give you a prophecy about your life? That, that sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? And if, if Jesus were to say something like that, I'm sure Peter would be going, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to set you free. Because remember the discussion they'd been having just a few days earlier? And, and Jesus says to Peter this, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourselves and went, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Now, how would you like to have that prophecy hanging over your head for your entire life? To know with absolute certainty that the day will come when you're going to be taken someplace you do not want to go. I wonder how many times in Peter's life did he wonder, is this what Jesus meant? Because Peter ended up being taken a lot of places he didn't want to go. But on that day that they marched him out to nail him to a cross, did he finally say, ah, I see it now. Do you remember what Peter did? Luke 22.33. Luke 22.33. Do you remember what Peter did? It was again on the night that Jesus was uh, about to be arrested taken for trial. And, and as he's there, Peter is, is shooting off his mouth just like everyone else. Let's not just put Peter out here on the, on the end of the plank by himself. All the 11 are out there with Peter. And they're going on and on. Peter thumps his chest and goes, Jesus, I'm ready to go to prison and to death with you. And I don't know Jesus' facial expression. Did he give him a sly smile? Did he shake his head? Did he cast down his eyes and shake his head? I, I don't know. We don't know the nonverbal cues that Jesus gave. But he said, Peter, before the cock crows the third time, you'll have denied me three times. And Peter yells and screams and hollers. And of course, does exactly what Jesus said. But here's the thing that you may not have thought about, and maybe you did, but, but I'll point it out either way. Of the eleven that were there with him at that moment. Every one of them ended up going to prison and or death with him. Every one of them. And you know the difference is, when you go to Revelation chapter 1, John... The last one of them alive is on the island of Patmos. He's in prison. And Jesus shows up. He says, I saw, I heard a sound like many waters. I turned. You ever been to Niagara Falls? Just the thunder of that. Uh, I, I heard a sound that was overwhelming and I turned and there was Jesus. When Jesus appeared with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, what was the outcome? They got out of the burning, fiery furnace, didn't they? They walked out of it. 
when Jesus sent his angel to Daniel in the lion's den, what was the end of the story? Daniel walked out of the lion's den. But when Jesus showed up on the island of Patmos with John, what's the end of the story? John writes the book of Revelation. And then he wastes away and ends the rest of his life on the island of Patmos in prison till the day he dies. A different outcome, isn't it? Now, now here's the thing. Can you be thankful with a God in scarcity? In America, we have had the privilege of being thankful to a God for abundance. We've had more than we need. Let's be honest. Could, could most of us do with less than we have? It's nice to have it, but do we need it to survive? In fact, of most of what the young people here think are absolutely essential wasn't even available when I was a kid. We have a kid at school that they do have to do a journal every morning. It's Today is November, whatever, 2022. My favorite this is, or my... I, I like to do this, or I over the weekend I, and every single answer this one kid gives is a PS4. It's all his journals are ever about. Forget about PS4s, they didn't have Pong when I was a kid. And you know what? I grew up perfectly fine. Probably better than a lot of the kids today. And what I had compared to what my father had, because he grew up in the 20s, and into the 30s, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're to be pitied more than all men. Now here's the question I have to ask. Is that a sad statement? Is that a sad statement? Or is that a triumphal statement? Because we do have hope beyond this grave. And that's the secret to being thankful in scarcity. Nothing that happens in this life will last not the highest high or the lowest low. Nothing lasts for those who are in Christ. <coughs> I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Just under a year ago, one of the people at school asked me a question. They said, well, it was in February. Do you think Putin's going to invade Ukraine? 
And I looked at the situation and I said, there is not a prayer in the world that anything good will come out of that for Putin or anyone else. If Putin goes in there, it will be the most disastrous thing that has happened during his reign and may very likely spell the end of it. And I went to him and I said, the man would have to be a fool to go in there. There's no way he can win. It will cost him all of his prestige. It will cost him all of his equipment. He'll come out of it just broken. No one's that foolish. Now you can say, oh, pastor, you couldn't have said that, known all that back then. But it was readily apparent to anyone. And what, about a week later, he invaded. And the guy came to me and said, I thought you said he'd... And I go, there's no earthly reason for him to have done it. From that moment on, I knew something. I have no concept of what's going to happen next in this world. We are in days that are so psychologically just nuts that you can't predict what people will do today. But it doesn't matter. Because the end of the story has already been written. But I think, I don't know this, so I'm not saying I know, I think that there is a great possibility that in the future, not too far away, far enough that most of us will live through it significant portions of what we have left of our lives, there could be times of real scarcity and hardship in this nation. That's a possibility. It's a good possibility. Here's my question. Can you be thankful in the midst of that? Can you, like Paul, learn how to both abase and abound? Can you take joy in the little victories, the little deliverances? Let's tie this back to the past and end. And here it is. Those pilgrims that held that first Thanksgiving 400 plus years ago had lived through two years in which over half of them had died. Now I don't know what that would do to you or me, but I want you to think about a place where there was not a home in the town where half the people were gone. Not a lot of children, but some. But there wasn't a child there who wasn't at least half an orphan, if not fully an orphan. Women suffered far more radically than men. And so, because there were more men to begin with, there were a number of single men and and then married men with their wives, but there were no unmarried women who went on the journey Most of the children there, the majority, had lost their mothers. But by our standards, that isn't very conducive to rejoicing, is it? What did they have to be thankful for? They'd learned the secret that Paul says. They'd learned how to be in plenty and in want. And having been in the level of want that they had been, to suddenly just have enough to make it seemed like a beautiful country. And they were thankful. We've been spoiled. We've had more than we need. We've had so much that we throw a lot of it away, don't we? Can we begin today to contemplate what it would be like to be thankful in scarcity? To be able to say, I'll rejoice even when 
I'm not in a wide and blessed land. Can we prepare our hearts for that day? And if it doesn't come, we can say, praise God, hallelujah, it's better than I thought it would be. But if it does, we'll be prepared. Because in that day, the people in America will need an example of what a godly person is. And that's our day to shine. Amen? Let's bow together. Oh God, I certainly don't want to go through a day of hardship. I've never been rich, but I've always had more than enough. And I'm appreciative of that. The thought of going through scarcity and hardship is frankly scary. But I have brothers and sisters around the world that have lived that way for decades. And I listen to them singing and clapping and rejoicing. And I say, if that day is to come, Lord, teach me the secret of how to abase and abound. How to be content with whatever I have. And how to always be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.